Hello everyone, um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, whatever time it is for you and welcome to this Raspberry Pi Foundation Computing Education Research Seminar. I'm Sue Sentence and I'm chairing today um, and we're delighted that Mark Gusdile has come all the way from Michigan to um, speak to us today on this our first seminar of a new series on cross-disciplinary computing. Um, we have the our normal structure of our sessions. If you've been before, I can see lots of familiar smiley faces um, from previous seminars. Um, we have a sort of 35 to 40 minute presentation from uh, Mark. We're then going to split into breakout rooms for 15 to 20 minutes. And then we'll come back for a, big, uh, a general Q&A so that everybody gets a chance to talk about the seminar and then feedback their um, discussions to Mark. So as I say, this is a new series. It's on cross-disciplinary computing. So we're going to hear about a breadth of different perspectives on computing. And I'm really excited of the sort of range of speakers that we've got. And I'm I think beyond delighted, I've exhausted that expression, but I'm beyond delighted to have Mark um, coming to talk to us today. Um, I've known Mark, um, uh, knew of him and then knew him for, for several years. And uh, he's a huge influencer, influencer and um, a really important person for us in the field of computing education research. He's, I'll just um, read through the bio. He's a professor in computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan. He studies how people learn computing and how to improve that learning. And he was one of the founders of, a, of, of the International Computing Education Research Conference. He's one of the leads on the Expanding Computing Education Pathways Alliance and is a fellow of the Association of Computing Machinery, the ACM. Um, so, but amongst all that, um, all, the, all those uh, credentials. He's also a great speaker and is, is coming to talk to us about really new and current research that he's doing. So Mark, over to you. Um, you could be able to share your slides um, and look forward to hearing from you. So thanks so much. I'm really enjoying watching all the discussion and the invention of hashtags uh, and all the great folks who are who have joined tonight. I really appreciate it. So I want to talk today about this is the, the building that I now live in at the University of Michigan. I was at Georgia Tech for 25 years, um, but I've now moved to the University of Michigan in computer science and engineering. I want to start out with this picture. This is C.P. Snow um, and his book, The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution, was required reading when I was a graduate student in my advisors group, Elliot Solway at the University of Michigan. Um, if you're not familiar with this, uh, Snow wrote about his time as a scientific advisor in World War II and bemoaned the split in Western society between what we'd now consider to be the STEM fields and the more general humanities perspective. Um, Snow blamed the humanities folks, but we're not gonna get into that. The reason why Eliot had us read this was that he wanted us to think about who needs what kinds of education we have to offer who might not even choose to come into our classrooms. So here's the story that I wanna to talk to you about today. Um, I'm gonna to first make an, a, a brief historical argument that computing was actually created in order to be taught to everyone. That was the explicit goals of the people who invented the field. Um, are we reaching everyone now? Um, hint, the answer is no, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of data to, to, to back that up. And then I'm gonna talk about our approach to using teaspoon languages as a way to change computing to reach everybody. And we'll talk about history, uh, a pr one that we've created for mathematics and engineering called pixel equations, and another one we've created for mathematics and combinatorics. And then I wanna to get to the big question that I'm hoping that this audience can help me explore. So what are the students learning here? What do we wanna call that? What are the goals? All right, so in 1961, um, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, held a symposium at their Sloan School, their business school, Computers in the World of the Future. This book was edited by Martin Greenberger, it came out the next year, and it's this amazing transcript of all of the lectures and all of the discussant notes. The attendees at this, at this symposium were a who's who of computing in 1961. It's uh, Gene Omdahl and John McCarthy, Herb Simon, Grace Hopper, um, Alan Newell. So I wanna particularly talk about where C.P. Snow spoke. 
Um, one of his discussants was uh, Norbert, Norbert Weiner, um, the inventor of cybernetics. So Snow made the argument that absolutely everybody should take a course in computer science. And his argument was about trying to teach in order to enhance democracy. He foresaw in 1961 that computing was going to become super important and not understanding computing was going to be a, a detriment. What he particularly worried about, excuse me for reading this quote to you, a handful of people having no relation to the will of society, having no communication with the rest of society, will be taking decisions in secret which are going to affect our lives in the deepest sense. That's pretty amazingly prescient for 1961 for the role that computing was going to play in society and about how a very few people were going to be able to build that computing. Another one of the lectures that actually made the same argument that we should teach computer science to everybody was from Alan Perlis. Alan Perlis, you might be aware, was the, is the first ACM Turing Award winner. He also went on to create the computing departments at Yale University in Carnegie Tech, now Carnegie Mellon University. One of his discussants was J.C.R. Licklider, who is generally considered to be the person who thought first up the internet um, and then helped to create it through uh, DARPANET. So Perlis made the argument that everyone at in the university should take a course in computer science and his argument, uh, and explicitly should include programming, and his argument was made in contrast to calculus. So calculus is generally considered to be something that everybody should know about, and calculus is the study of rates. He says computer science is the study of process, and everybody needs to know about process. An automated process changes the way that we think about things. So he explicitly makes the argument that programming gives us tools for changing how we understand things that we already know about. Perlis, in 1967, joined up with Herb Simon and Alan Newell to publish what is generally considered the first definition of computer science in the journal Science in 1967. And they, they said that computer science was the study of computers and all the phenomena surrounding them. A lot of computer scientists I talked to find this to be a little bit too broad. Let's call that computing. And that's what this big umbrella of ideas related to computing. And that's what I wanna think about what we want students to know. So this is a pretty scary number for those of us in the United States. This is the percentage of US high school students currently enrolled in a computer science course over this last year. Uh, for us, high school is ages 14 to roughly 18 years old. Um, and in the United States, in most states and most cities, there is no requirement at the primary or lower secondary level to take any computer science. So this is literally the percentage of kids in the United States who get access to a computer science course in any form. Um, for those who are not familiar in the United States, we have a highly distributed model of primary and secondary school education. Individual states make their own decisions about what's going to be taught. And they, though some of those states push the decisions further down. So individual cities will have their own requirements for what's involved in high school graduation. So I want to explore this number a little bit more, the 4.7%. In many states, they've been publishing dashboards to let people keep track of how computing education is going in their state. This is a picture of the dashboard for the state of Texas. And so you can see from 2012 to 2020, just how quickly is it, are, are we reaching more students? What's the percentage of students who are having access? You can see an enormous gender gap between male and female students. But you also just look at the slope of that curve. At what point do we reach 50% of all students having access to CS? At what point do we reach 100%? In general, we're decades out. So computer science is growing very slowly. Most of the data that I get to see from, from, from your side of the Atlantic is by watching the, the, the papers coming from Peter Kemp and the Roehampton report. In general, I know that you have computer science at the primary school level. But at the secondary school level, you have computer science, but there's not a whole lot of students taking it, um, much as it is here in the United States. So the data that, that I'm showing, a lot of this is coming from um, the, uh, the state of computer science reports from ESEPCO.org and CSTA. So let me make a bold statement here. The majority of secondary school students in the US and England have not seen computer science, or at least not in high school. I know that you all have in primary school in the United States, most students don't, don't have access to it. So how would we get it in front of more students? So I wanna 
play out a little bit of a comparison for you around advanced placement in US history and CS principles. For us in the United States, advanced placement is sort of like your A-levels, that it's sort of an advanced qualification that people can go for. AP US history is three times the size of um, CS principles, which is the most popular advanced placement exam or A-level um, in the United States around computer science. It is much more female and it is in general much more diverse. It's literally the case that if we can get computer science into a random history class, we will reach a far more diverse audience than we will from the average computer science course. But what sort of computer science could we fit into a history course? That's where my research is at today. So I'm interested in building these things that we call teaspoon languages. A teaspoon language is a task specific programming language. It's a specification of process. It really is programming. It's a specification of process to be executed by a computational agent. There's two pieces of it that are really important. First of all, is that it's useful. It supports a task, a learning activity that an other than CS teacher wants to achieve. We do all of our work with participatory design. We work with teachers and say, what is it that you want your students to be able to do? And then we think about ways of putting that into a programming language to make that easier. And it has to be usable. It can be learned in less than 10 minutes. So these are very small languages. We say that we are adding a teaspoon of computing to other subjects, task-specific programming teaspoon. It's a little bit of a pun. All right, so let me show you one of these. Um, this is in collaboration with Tammy Schreiner, who's a history professor at Grand Valley State University. She's very interested in data literacy. Um, in all 50 US states, social studies teachers are expected to teach about data visualizations, but very few of them do. Um, as, as Tammy likes to say, um, you don't become a US history teacher because you love numbers, data, and computers. So how do I make that accessible to, to a history teacher? So this is our tool, data visualization, for, um, data visualization for Learning. Let me highlight some of the pieces to you. First of all, when we work with teachers, they say that all inquiry in history classes starts with a driving question. So we have a prompt explicitly for a driving question, which can be one, of the, one that a teacher has specified or the student can write for, the, for themselves. We always have two graphs available at any time. And this comes from, again, from history uh, researchers in, around inquiry that say that a problem becomes an interesting history problem when there's two pieces of data or two uh, accounts that disagree in some way. Here we see the population of Ethiopia from 1800 to 2016 and the population of Rwanda. In Rwanda, there's a dip. And the question is, why? Why did the population dip in Rwanda during those years? We know that it's the Rwanda genocide. We want the students to try to investigate that. We also expect students to be generating multiple graphs as part of an inquiry process. So we create a space for them to save their graphs on the right-hand side. If they were to hover over the customize button, they get a very small script. It, this is in the format of the Vega Light programming language, which is a visualization language that our teachers really liked in our early participatory design. So we use that format. And this is a specification of that graph. And if you click on the customize button, you see the graph in the, uh, the, the, the script in the middle, the same pull down menus on the left hand side for specifying the graph, and then the graph itself on the right hand side. And now I can explicitly modify the script itself and then save the change. And when I do, I'm gonna update the pull down menus. So now these are linked representations. As I make changes to the pull down menus, I also update the script. As you make changes to the script, I also update the pull down menu. So it's to help people understand the relationship between the things they've done before and the things they can now do with the programming language. As I said, these are very small programming languages, not Turing complete, and you have now seen everything there is to know about db 4 l Let me show you another one. This is Pixel Equations. Pixel Equations is being developed in collaboration with a, uh, a high school in Detroit Public Schools for an engineering class. And in this engineering class, the students are going to be um, analyzing robot LIDAR data that, that's gonna be gathered by a robot and then trying to visualize it. We talked to undergraduates in computer science who had solved the same sort of problem, actually the robotic students. We're talking to these robotic students and they're telling us the things that they found challenging. And they worked with math educators to identifying the learning objectives that, that the students found challenging that we would need to help the high school students with. So the first part is that they're basically building image filters. We want them to identify a picture that they want to use as input. 
And then to realize that they can use an equation of a line or an equation of a, of a section of a graph to describe part of a picture, that what they know about using mathematics to, selection, to select part of a graph can also be used to select part of a, of a picture. Second is that they can also specify colors using mathematics that here we're using red, green, and blue, each of which varies between zero and 255. And we could use an equation to specify how we want the green to change here if Y is less than 200. And the third is that we could select which pixels we want to apply a transformation to based on the value inside the pixel. So we can say, if there's a lot of blue, if blue is greater than 200, we're going to half the blue. We're going to reduce it by 50%. So the idea here is that, and if all of you who are looking at this right now recognize that this is programming, that these are the Boolean expressions that would be in an if, these are the right-hand sides of an equation that we might use for specifying the red, green, and blue. But all of the for loops, all the ifs, all the curly braces, all the semicolons, all the definitions of function have been ripped out. So there's only the mathematics here. It really is programming, but it's just about the math. And I'm pleased that both Elise Lockwood and Adeline Chen are here to, to hear this part of the talk. So I've been working with Elise and, uh, and Addie for a while, thinking about the work that Elise has been doing with teaching combinatorics with Python. She has students solve counting problems like this one. How many arrangements do you expect to get from the letters in the word rocket? But by having them write Python programs to actually generate all those combinations, and then they can count them and look for the patterns that are in there. And then she gives them additional challenges, like what if there's no, you don't want any repeated letters? Or what if the order matters or doesn't matter? So I really love this work, but I thought that Python might be overkill. Could we make it simpler? So this is an example of one of the tools that uh, we've been creating in collaboration with Elise and Addie, having them as our co-designers, telling us what work and what might work and what won't work. It's meant to look like a spreadsheet. So here we say, if I have three uh, shirts, a tee, a polo, or a sweater, and two pants, a jeans, or a khaki, what are all the possible combinations that I might have? And then our tool then generates all those poss possibilities. If you have five coins, heads and tails, you can just say, I want heads and tails to copy in all five columns. If I want to solve that problem about two letter words from Rocket, I could just have all the letters, R-O-C-K-E-T in both columns. That'll be two letters. Or I can say column two is all the data from, from column one. What if I don't want duplications? I don't want R-R and O-O to occur. I can say, now I want column two be all the data from column one minus whatever was picked for that first item or for that first slot. Now, what if I don't want both RO and OR? I, I want the, the, the matter to not be important. Well, then I could say only select things in the second column that come after the item that was from the first column after index one. That's the entire programming language. That's all there is to counting sheets. Again, not turn complete, really small, specifically for the challenge of solving counting problems. Oh, and by the way, we also support um, we also support Spanish keywords, and we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. So here's the question that I'd really love for you all to ponder with me: Is this computing education? What are the students learning here? I'm a big fan of this work that's been going on at the University of Chicago and Diana Franklin's lab, where they've been asking the question: What's the starting place? for K through eight primary school CS learners. And they've been building these learning trajectories that describe what are the set of concepts that need to be learned in order to understand the sequence of a program? What are the things that need to be understood to understand repetition? Let me zoom in to the left-hand side to make that a little bit easier to see. So what comes first when learning programming? I suggest that this doesn't just have to do with primary school. I suggest this has to do with whenever somebody's learning programming, that you have to be able to understand things like Precision and completeness are important when you're writing instructions in advance. Different set of instructions can produce the same output, or programs can be, uh, can be, are made by assembly instructions from a limited set, some tasks involve repetition, and programs use conditions to end loops. Now, I'm betting, for all of you computer science teachers, you're looking at this list and saying, well, sure. I mean, yes, you have to know these things, but the, aren't these totally obvious? And isn't this the bare minimum? You learn this and then you go on to everything else? Well, actually, Scratch doesn't use that whole list. So yes, you can do all those things in Scratch, 
But if you look at what Scratch students, what students using Scratch really do, and there's been over 60 million users of Scratch and many studies about what students are actually doing in Scratch. One of my favorites is by Yasmin Kafai and Debbie Fields. And they show that most students using Scratch use it for storytelling. And the, if there's any loops at all, they're only forever loops. There's no Booleans at all. There's just movement and sequence. With that little bit of computing, you still get 60 million users. It turns out that there is expressive power in even a small subset of computer science. One of the projects that really inspires me is Bootstrap Algebra. Bootstrap Algebra is an, uh, a unit that is taught within algebra that actually improves students learning in algebra and being able to solve story problems. Um, it's been developed by the folks, uh, uh, Emmanuel Schanzer, Kathy Fisler, uh, Srinam Krishnamurti, and colleagues. Um, this table here is a description about what's taught in, in Bootstrap Algebra. And if you look at the middle column there, those are the programming concepts you'll see it's, they're using a functional language. Students don't even code repetition. So it turns out that there is learning power. You really do improve learning in algebra from even a subset of computer science. Now, I mentioned that we've been doing participatory design studies with history teachers. We put these tools in front of social studies teachers and ask them to try them out and to tell us what they think. And we see a bunch of learning challenges that they face, which haven't really been all that well documented because these are really early folks in programming. Our social studies teachers have never, for the most part, ever seen programming or HTML. The whole idea of an intermediate representation that you type something in here, which doesn't look anything like the output, and then it gets transformed into the output by the computer, that is a novel idea for these, for these teachers. They've never seen that before. And because there's an intermediate representation, sometimes the output is not what they want. And now they have to debug because either you specified your intention incorrectly or you didn't understand how the computer was going to transform these. I suggest that these big ideas about intermediate representations and that you might get your intentionality wrong are problems that even our, our students are learning are, are challenged with as well. But they're fairly early in the process. They're even to the left of the learning trajectories that I described to you from Diana Franklin's group. So I'm gonna repeat the bottom line. It's much more of a big deal in the United States where there is no requirement of computer science at the primary level. I suggest that we don't know much about teaching all students about computing. This too is programming. These things that I'm showing you, the, um, the scripts that are in db 4 the, the specification of the columns and the counting sheets, the specification of the image filters in pixel equations. These are specifying a process for a computational agent. In addition, they are actually useful to tools in history classes and mathematics and engineering classes. You'll notice too that on the, 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 the two right ones that we are developing teaspoon languages that support both English and Spanish keywords. Two thirds of the world does not speak English. Reaching everyone is going to require us to think about new languages and new tools that go beyond the hegemony of English. So I want to contrast the teaspoon languages with a strategy that's used in many states uh, around the, the challenge of re reaching everyone, see us for all. So the hour of code from code.org is about once a year, the students all use an hour of a Turing complete programming language, typically something like Blockly or Scratch. Um, and there, it's real computer science. We recognize that it's repetition, variables, and all the rest. Um, I'm doing something different. It, it's not either or, it's in addition to. And the idea is that I want to have one to three little languages in every social studies, mathematics, language arts, engineering course. The question is that which results in more retained and transferable CS learning? which creates more of a school culture about using programming across disciplines. So it's now time for you all to play with prototypes. I'm gonna open up the chat. So these are links to the tools that I just showed you as QR codes. I'm also going to make them available here as text. So here is DV4L. And you can get directly the scripting version, or you can go in through the, um, uh, the version that I showed you where you don't see a script, and then you can move into the script through the customize button. Um, and also one of our example activities that we have for, uh, that we developed for the teachers, we have two versions of pixel equations. 
The one is the one that I showed you. And the other one is a new one we've just created where the center of the picture is zero, zero. So now you can say X greater than zero and you'll get the right-hand side of a picture. We also have developed by uh, Emma Dodu, one of the PhD students working with me, a set of um, activity sheets to guide teachers in our participatory design sessions around using pixel equations. And finally, I will give you a link to the counting sheet. I wanna make clear here that we consider these to be prototypes. These things change a lot pretty quickly. And our focus is on getting feedback from teachers more than it is to create tools that uh, will, will work for all time. Okay, and now here are the questions that I would love for you all to think about in your discussion section and, and then give me feedback on this. Is, these are really hot research questions for me and I, I'd appreciate your insights. So first, what would it take to get other than CS teachers in your schools to try a teaspoon language in their class? Second, do you see students struggling with these fundamental issues of intermediate representations that we're describing, the things which are the left side of the learning trajectories um, in, in Diana Franklin's group? And third, how would you improve teaspoon languages? For what tasks should we be developing new teaspoon languages? And let me pause there and turn it back over to Diana to send us off into our discussions. Thank you. Um, before we do that, let's just give Mark a big round of applause or jazz hands or thank you in the chat. And um, yeah, very, um, really interesting. You went through so, there's so much there to discuss. Uh, what we normally do now is we're going to um, ask Mark some questions. So Mark, have you started um, uh, with, your, with your teaspoon languages? Um, have you got any sort of um, evidence yet from teachers and how that how that they found them was it too early in the ah let's see about teachers yeah that's, uh, th thank you Sue great question uh, I, I was expecting the question what do you know about students and nothing um, our our focus has been so our, our we we were doing the teaspoon languages explicitly to try to reach a more diverse population of students we want to get students not just the ones who volunteer to take computer science classes so. We really want to reach formal computing education as opposed to informal mechanisms. So we really want to figure out what, it, what does it take to get a history teacher to decide to invite a programming language into their classroom? What does it take to get a mathematics or an engineering teacher to invite a computer into their uh, programming language into their classroom? So all of our focus has been so far on what makes a programming language adoptable. Um, this is work with my PhD student, Bahari Namipur. Um, I'm also working with Tamara Nelson from, who's particularly interested in these questions about intermediate representations and debugging. So we now know a lot about what teachers are after. Uh, I'll give you one brief finding. We started out, as you saw, with a framing around usability and usefulness using the technology acceptance model. Technology acceptance model says that people will adopt technology that is both useful and is usable. And we're finding that when it comes to teachers, that's not always true that what also influences teachers is the context of where they're teaching. They're not gonna do something which goes against what everybody else in the, in the school is doing, particularly when it's a first year teacher. When it's an early teacher, they're less likely to be the ones who pick up something new. At least that's what we're finding in our experience. So all of our focus so far has been on what gets a teacher to adopt. Well, I'm really excited that we are just, just this month, literally doing our first tests within classrooms with our teaspoon languages. So I'm hoping I can say more about that later. But right now the focus has been on the teachers. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and now I think Ethel had a hand up for a question. Um, yeah, I'm here. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, we had interesting discussions. Our group was filled with educators, you know, so they, they, they already have a familiarity and one of them was saying they're already adopting something similar to teaspoon languages where they are bringing in some kind of applications into teaching non-CS uh, non subjects to teach students about computational thinking. Um, so what was interesting was uh, the second uh, question where you were saying, do we see students struggling uh, with learning these languages, um, especially in the way they are being displayed with the code in between and then the left, what does supposed to actually be learning? Um, Samantha gave a really 
a good point here to say that um, she doesn't see the students struggling themselves, but the best way would be to start with the teachers and motivate them and let them not resist the teaspoon languages, but rather, you know, plan how you're going to train them and involve them such that they are convinced and uh, motivated to, to bring teaspoon languages into their classrooms. So it was more of a comment to say, uh, the students will be willing to do it and have less struggle. Actually, she was thinking uh, the students are the ones who will end up leading the teachers. Uh, Samantha, I don't know if you want to add more on that. You did a great, a great summary. Yeah, it's more about how do we get the teachers to adopt it and show them the connections to the content area and because the teach or the students eat it up and then they're the ones that really drive it and they start requesting more. Um, but that teacher fear is the, the thing that we tend to work most around. I completely, that, that echoes my experience as well, Samantha. Um, and, and thank you for the, for the question, comment, Ethel. Um, yeah, this is, this, is, this is the real challenge. Uh, so we draw a lot on the work in participatory design for learning, uh, work from Betsy DeSalvo and others. And in general, kids are much more willing to use technology than the teachers are. The real trick is figuring out something that, that the teacher will, will adopt and will bring into their classroom, particularly the non-computer science classroom. So that's been the real focus of our research so far. What does it take to get a teacher? So um, a, a lot of what I, I hope that came through the talk, our tasks are things the teachers say they want. Right? They're going to solve the kinds of counting problems that Elise and Addie have been working on. They want to solve, they want teachers, they want their students to do data visualization things. And so we are trying to build the tools that meet their needs and then making changes. You know, I showed you that the DB4L has a prompt for a driving question. I dare say that maybe we have the only IDE or visualization tool in the world that explicitly asks you about a driving question, because that's what our history teachers wanted. Right? We are explicitly designing because the history teachers are saying, I want this. And so we build those features in. Brilliant. Thank you. So Tim Elliott, you had your, you asked a question in the chat. Do you want from is that from your group? Do you want to ask Mark? Uh, Mark, how many teaspoon languages exist? And where can I see a list? Um, there's probably another half dozen or so besides the, the three that I showed you today. Um, no, I won't do a list. If you want to email me, we can talk about it. Um, okay. The reason why is because a lot of these, these are, I mean, as you all saw, these are really tiny languages. So yes. we often build one for a particular purpose that may or may not get used for that purpose. And it may change like tomorrow or in the next three hours. And okay. so I'm loath to say, here are all the tools, please start using them. I am eager to work with teachers and districts and schools. To, so for example, some of these tools like the pixel equations, there are multiple versions of it already. There's one for the Detroit Public School. There's another one that Aman Yadav is using at Michigan State. We're creating variations on these tools as needed for particular populations. Um, I just built another one for Aman. He's been doing these really interesting problems. The, the oh, I may not be saying the, the Babras problems, these computational thinking activities. Um, they're all for not use on the computer. Well, I took one of them and turned it into a programming language. So you could do it on the computer so that we could ask the question, so what is doing it on the computer really change about the activity and about how students learn? So a lot of these are very small. We have several that we're testing with history teachers right now. We have a timeline building tool. So in addition to the graph building tool, we also have a couple of other slow reveal or slow construct graph tools. If you're not familiar with slow reveal graphs, Google it. It's really a cool idea. Um, comes out of math ed. It's now being applied in social studies education. So we're building some tools around that. We have three of those that have been in creation. So the, it's, it's a long answer to a short question. Um, so I'm happy to work with individuals, but I'm not posting a full list of all of them right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next comment in the chat was from, I mean, obviously that you don't have to just make questions because there were discussion points. So happy for everyone to make comments. Um, Ken um, Khan had the next comment. Is that a comment or would you like to ask yeah. that question? Yeah, um, so, 
as I get much it. as I, I, I like the idea of, of these teaspoon languages, I'm not clear what's so new about it, that how different is it than the old logo idea of micro worlds or even more clearly like the net logo model there's hundreds of them and on topics, you know, that fit the curriculum or not. And they're, you know, biology, social science, and very much like some of the ones you showed, there's a few sliders, a few pull down menus where you could, uh, you know, change the way this epidemic flows and then run it and then change it and run it. And of course, around it, there could be the driving questions, but I, I just don't quite see, uh, how different the, these TSPs are than, uh, again, something like a, a net logo model? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, let me relate a, a story that, that that Sue and I were talking about uh, during, during the discussion period. Um, so I work with Tammy Schreiner studying social studies teachers as they go from their, their methods course where they're learning how to teach social studies out into the classroom. And then we watch them over multiple years to see how their attitudes and their practices around data visualization and data literacy change. Um, one of the surprising things that I find is when I ask these, these teachers, um, so are you comfortable building data visualizations? They say, oh, sure, they're all totally confident. But a number of them will then say, well, of course, only if I'm using pen, paper, and ruler. I would never use a computer. I mean, I find Excel to be really challenging. Or Google Sheets. I can do Excel, but I can't also do Google Sheets. And I realized that our assumption that we make as computer scientists that with spreadsheets, we have finally made computing available to everybody is simply false. There's a whole bunch of people that find spreadsheets really too complicated. I'm working at that level. I'm interested in finding how to reach teachers who find things like logo too complicated, who find net logo too complicated, who are put off even by block-based programming languages. I'm trying to dramatically improve usability by working very closely with individual teachers to be able to do participatory design to build programming languages that meet their needs for their classroom. So that's the difference, Ken. I am not trying to do a generalized programming language here. I see the value of them, but I first want to push on how close can I get it to look like history, mathematics, engineering, and science so that I get more teachers to buy in related to Samantha's comment a few minutes ago. We've really got to think about what it takes to get a teacher to be willing to adopt and learn logo first. Hmm, I don't think that's going to work. No, I mean, that's a good answer, but I, I worry that th there's always been this uh, idea of hiding things like a snap for example, there, there's many applications where people have just hidden almost all the blocks and just give the students the three or four that are really is a, a TSP. Or, an, or the net logo models that you don't have to click the button to actually see the net logo. It's all, it, it, there's many lessons in which you never look at the code and you're just running a model, but making changes to the parameters of the model to explore something. So it, it's still not a, a very, I, I like better the idea that it's a full programming language, a powerful one that's well suited for children. And then you are only showing the students and the teachers a tiny little piece of it and the rest of it is well hidden. Uh, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable approach. That's not my approach. My approach is making it so that it works for the teachers where it's not about there's something hidden. I'm giving you the whole thing, but that's all there is. It's just about your task. And I don't expect you to use this programming language more than a single lesson. I mean, that's the, the critical part about the usability, learnable and usable in only 10 minutes, because that's all there is. You wanna go do something more powerful? Move on to a more powerful tool. And so great that you'd want to do something more powerful. First, I wanna make sure that your task is highly successful, highly usable. Thank you. Well, I think that the message is around, you know, there are different tools that you can use in different um, circumstances, not, not just one for everything. Um, so Jane is, um, you've put a, you were next on my list, Jane, uh, from yeah. your group. You've got a number of questions there. Yeah. Do you want to pick one? Yeah, so I'm not going to ask that. The, the first question that I had, we had, we were talking about progression, but I think you've answered that, Mark, that it's a disposable kind of loss leader to get them interested. And then the, you, know, you need to hand them back over to the computer science teachers. 
Um, but we wondered, you, have you only been working with, so the history teachers, or have you had a computer science teacher as kind of working collaboratively on the languages? Or has it, I'm working on geography right now, I'll do a geography teacher. Is it just for, for that one teacher? It's only the domains. So we, we work with more than the history teachers. So for example, I think that uh, Elise Lockwood and Adeline DeChen here on the, on, on the call, they probably would refer to themselves as math teachers more than computer science teachers. We work with them. Um, uh, Elise will tell you about her, her, her patience with looking at some of my early tools and saying, no, that's not right. Um, and then I build a new one. Um, so I am very focused on making it work for the other than computer science teacher. So if some computer science teacher wants to use one of these in their classroom, that's fantastic, but that's not my focus. My focus is on thinking about how do I get computing into those other classes where there's more diversity of students. That, that's my goal. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm moving over to Samantha, who had a um, question earlier about getting involved in, how to get involved in the research. Then I think you had another question, Samantha. I'll let you choose which one you want to ask Mark. Yeah, I'll, Mark, I'm loving this. Um, I, I'll just make a short comment. I'd love to figure out if we can collaborate um, and like help you do research because I work with districts all over the state of Iowa and on this specifically, and I would love to participate. So I'll leave it there, Con contact you. <laughs> Thank you, Samantha. I would really appreciate it. That is our greatest challenge. And particularly, as I'm sure that everyone who's doing research has found, during the pandemic, it's very hard to get teachers to volunteer for anything, particularly when, well, they're very stressed just making their daily lives work. Um, but, you know, and so any teaspoon language is going to be a little bit more, right? It's, it's, I'm trying to solve their tasks, but it's more than just doing it with pencil, and paper, and ruler. So it's been hard to find teachers who are willing to do that, that gamble of spending some participatory design time with me. So I appreciate that, Samantha. Great. Um, so I'm going to go to Carol next, who is a maths teacher, and uh, and then Jonathan, and then Catherine from their group. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Yes, and um, you sort of answered this one because I I was thinking um, you could would you just use Python on Scratch or whatever, or, or would you use Excel and and say GeoGebra or some of the other dynamic graphic packages for a maths lesson? Because then at least they can look into the program and you've done if they need to and develop it and also the teachers would see some value in it because that could give them confidence to content to, to sort of take it up do you see what I mean there I, I do and in fact um, the, the three uh, activity sheets that I shared that we de developed with pixel equations are part of a set of nine that my student Emma Dodu created for use with our math teachers where the other sheets were using things like GeoGebra, Desmos and Julia so yes, we are very explicitly exploring those other tools as well, because in part of it, it's not just about us trying to sell our tools. It's about setting our tools up in comparison with others so that teachers can say to us, oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah, that's not at all right. This is what I want. Can you use this part of Julia and this part of Desmos and these parts of GeoGebra? Um, that's the kind of game that we're, that we're trying to play. We want teachers, we, we use these as design probes. Here's a thing, tell us what you think about it, and then tell us what you want that makes it even better. Um, or tell us what's wrong with that. So I'm in, totally in favor of all of those tools. And I can tell you that the, the math engineering class that we're working with at Detroit Public Schools is using all those other tools. But they're also using pixel equations because it solves a particular task well that the other tools don't. And that's, that's my entire game. I want to find particular tasks where programming is appropriate, where it's appropriate to specify a process for a computational agent. And then I want to make that as easy to use and adopt as possible. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, you had some comments in the chat. Do you want to raise those with Mark? <laughs> Um, I've, I've got one thing I'd like to say, which is I heard a great talk where somebody said people don't want to use your software. People want to have used your software. They want, don't want to spend their time ordering groceries online. They want to have ordered their groceries, groceries online. And I think this fits very well into Mark's idea of something that you can use and get done with in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. People don't want to learn how to use software. They want to do something. Yes, so mm. getting up and running very quickly. Yes. The other thing I 
want to say is I think Hans Rosling is really brilliant. And for those that know him, he, he, he's a very good example of somebody who's using software because he wants to do something and not because he wants to write software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop at Thank that you. point. Brilliant. Well, the next, um, I've uh, Catherine and then Jean and then Angela's got a hand up. So, um, Catherine, Childs, did you have some comments on your group? Sure. Thank you, Sue. I mean, I think some of it has already been covered in the discussion a little bit already. Um, but we had a really interesting discussion in our breakout group, which I think Carol's question has picked up on a little bit about this trade off between programming languages that follow the Papert principles of low floors, wide walls, high ceilings um, versus programming languages and environments that are low floors, but low ceilings as well to do a specific job. Um, and it's really interesting to think about, I mean, we were talking quite hypothetically about the advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, and is it possible that this could lead to sort of like two tier computing where everybody does a very basic level of um, teaspoon programming for want of a better word, but then the cool geeky ones go on and do proper computing as well. And I'm using proper in inverted commas, obviously. Uh, but how would this work in a sort of integrated curriculum, I suppose? There's a lot there. Um, thank you. This is a really interesting set of points, Catherine. Let me, let me address the first point about, um, I, I don't want to think of this as being in contrast to a, a, a Papertian notion of um, uh, low threshold, high ceiling, wide walls. Let me instead suggest, what if you visited many rooms? Every one of them had a low threshold, wide walls and a high ceiling. Or maybe not all of them have that shape. Maybe some of them have other shapes as well. I think that's the kind of goal that I'm after. Rather than think about one tool, one language um, that, that would be used for everything. What if there's individual tools that teachers in that particular curriculum are very happy with but then as a student, you end up visiting many of these languages. We actually know that there's a lot of advantages for students to learn more than one programming language. We know something from the research about the advantages of learning more than one, but it's usually very expensive and difficult to learn more than one. What if you use a functional language here and an imperative language here and these other kinds of languages? I mean, the, the counting sheets tool that I've been doing with uh, Elise and Addie, it's actually much closer to Prolog I mean, it's, it's more like a logic programming language than it is a traditional imperative or functional language. What if students see several of these tools, now they enter computer science? What is it they're after? And then let me address the second point too about, you know, well, some students go on to, to, to proper computer science. In the United States, it's literally the case that 95% of the kids aren't seeing anything at all. What does it take to reach that 95%? That's part of the goal that I'm after. So I think that we have to, perhaps change our, our, our goals, explore other variations, other pathways. Well, yeah, I think that links to Jean's question as well, which is around into how, um, Jean, if you're there, you must have yeah. a little while ago. I can ask the question. Yeah. Um, so Mark, um, with your participatory design sessions with teachers, uh, where do you see these teaspoon languages being integrated or more most or being most welcome? Because in our group, we were talking about how um, teachers who are teaching those AP classes or those A level classes may be more reticent to integrate them, even no, how, no matter how little time they take, just because they have the pressure of that big exam at the end of the year. Absolutely. Um, so lots of different answers. Um, one is that we've actually found a lot of welcoming response from elementary school teachers because elementary school teachers it's usually one teacher for all subjects and so they naturally are looking for ways of integrating things which we found a little bit surprising um it's not what i expected i mean i, I don't come from an elementary school background so that's something that but on the other hand i don't know how to make the usability such that it works even in elementary school um, we, uh, Bahari Namipur is working with both middle school and high school social studies teachers right now. So what is that in, in UK terms? Maybe um, uh, 
10 to 14 and then 14 to 18 and find that they have different needs. The high school teachers actually like more of the textual programming language than the middle school teachers. So at least the ones that we've been, we've been in our participatory design sessions. So we're still looking, Gene, on how to tune the interface for these different groups. I actually am not trying to get into AP classes, but AP US history versus AP CS principles is, was a reasonable comparison point. But I'm thinking that it's the more uh, required mainstream courses are the ones that are more likely to be, to be interested in trying to adopt tools like this. Does that help? Cool, thank you. Brilliant, okay. And there's a lot of conversation going on in the chat, which we will share with you later, Mark. So I can't now, it's difficult to work out what's the comment and what's the question, but I'll go to Angela because she's got her hand up and then Julie, I think you do have a question. So Angela, over to you. Thank you. So um, I kind of said some of this stuff in the chat, but uh, let's say for uh, like Mark, when you put up the 6% more students are participating in computer science in Texas. And then when you talk about AP classes, even though that that is not your um, kind of your goal to, for me, those are both ways of saying uh, exclusion. There are a lot of, when we look at those classes across the board, uh, they are very homogeneous uh, in terms of who they attract. And so if this is about making sure that 100% of the students are, are doing this kind of work, then I'm interested in who's behind the scenes. Um, you're talking about history teachers. I know that 80% of American teachers, period, in public school are white. And so there is going to be an ethical issue inherent uh, to me in the process. So how are you addressing that? Thank you. It's all about who we can get to come to our participatory design sessions, Angela. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great point. So we work really hard to reach diverse teachers in diverse high schools. So we have been working with uh, Detroit public schools, which is much more diverse than the folks that we can get in Ann Arbor schools. Um, because of the pandemic, there is this, you know, um, uh, the, 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 the positives and negatives, lots of negatives, but one of the positives is that we, our, particip our participatory design sessions can, they have to be online, but we can reach a really diverse audience. So we've got people from all over the state of Michigan who have been participating with us and telling us what they want. Um, our, um, I think I can say this, the, the, the use of DV4L right now is going on in, uh, in a school in Dearborn, which is a much more diverse um, population than what I might see in uh, uh, sort of here and in the Ann Arbor area. So we're really trying. I think your point is really well taken, Angela. And so we're making an effort to try to reach more diverse teachers. We don't mean to exclude, and it's hard to have a small research group reach everybody, but we're really trying to reach out to a, a diverse audience. Apologies, I muted myself. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mark, um, and thank you, Angela. Um, I'm going to um, Julie next, and I put it into the chat to say, then we're gonna start to, to uh, poor Mark's been grilled a lot. Um, uh, we'll start to wrap up the final question. So just put your hand up if you actually want to ask um, a final question before we um, wrap up. So Julie, you had a quick question. Yes, thank you. Mark, thank you for the presentation. I'm afraid I arrived a few minutes late. And so um, teaspoon languages, I needed to ask uh, one or two questions about it. But I really, I, I get a really good impression about their, their role. Um, could I ask you, what is your view um, on collaboration between departments, academic uh, uh, subject departments? So, for example, the computer science department collaborating with the geography or science or whatever on a, a project that that requires some interdisciplinary approach. Um, do you, could, can you see that working alongside the, the teaspoon languages? The teaspoon languages being within, um, so one is particular to history, but alongside that having more integration between subjects. So thank you, Julie. It's a, it's a, 
A great question, a lovely thought. It certainly is something that I would like to see more of. I think that it's challenging. I think that it has a lot to do with the individuals involved more than it does the departments themselves. Um, we've the Seymour Papert has come up several times in the conversation. One of my favorite uh, Papert papers is Turkle and Papert's epistemological pluralisms. And I've come to realize how many epistemological assumptions that I make working with people like Tammy Schreiner and Elise Lockwood and the other domain experts that I work with. Um, let me put one out, uh, a, a comment that the, this being a mostly computing education folks might find a little bit heretical. Um, I'm, I'm realizing the weaknesses of the ideas of constructionism. So let me take Elise and Addie's work as a case in point. So constructionism, as people are maybe not aware, the idea is that, that students are going to learn best, Nathan Holbert actually explicitly uses the word best, when they are explicitly constructing something, um, that, that that something which is a public, a part of, public artifact, a representation of their understanding. I will tell you that when Elise has students generate all the possible outcomes from a counting problem, that output is not the goal. It's not like you're going to enshrine this list of all the possible license plates. The artifact itself is not the goal. The goal is that students learn something by studying that artifact, by noticing the patterns, by seeing how many of them there are, and then learn something about counting sheets. When I work with history teachers, they don't really care about the graph so much. They want the students to come away with an understanding of, you know what? There was a genocide in Rwanda, and that led to a really huge decrease in the population, different than any of the other African nations near Rwanda. It's the understanding that matters. And that's hard for me as a computer scientist. No, oh, the artifact, constructionism, the artifact matters. Eh, not so much to all of the other areas. Now, I'm not saying that all other disciplines don't care about artifacts. I am saying that we have to have really broad notions of epistemology and how people come to understand if we want to do these sort of cross-cultural uh, conversations and discussions. Thank you. Um, we're getting a, covering a lot of ground um, in these questions, that's fantastic. Um, Ravi, you've got your hand up, but you may have had your question answered in the chat. Uh, there's lots of different conversations going on. Um, did you want to ask a question to Mark before we start to wrap up? Yeah, uh, Mark, um, thanks for the presentation. It was wonderful. Uh, one thing what I want to ask is like, where to start? What is the means, for example, if someone, if in case I want to ask um, or include some uh, history teacher to basically include some computers into it, what is the first point or um, what should I be looking in, into it? Start with a conversation of what is it that the history teacher wants to teach that they might find challenging or that they think that they might want to use computing but don't know how. Um, is, is, we the work that I started with Tammy Schreiner here in Michigan started because Michigan updated its social studies learning objectives, its learning standards, to say that all students ought to learn about data visualization. And all these history teachers suddenly said, I don't know anything about teaching data visualization. And that created this opening, this opportunity for us to say, well, let us build tools for you. And let's put out, you know, we're, we're showing people things like tools like CODAP the common data analysis platform. It's explicitly designed to be a middle school, high school visualization tool. And then we watch history teachers not succeed with it. And they tell us what doesn't work. And that informs what we do next. So I think the first part is a conversation about what are the tasks, the learning tasks, the things that you want your students to do that where computing might help and that you might be able to help them in figuring out how to make computing work for their classroom. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Brilliant. Okay, well, I think that is our last question. So thank you, Mark, you have ha you have answered so many questions. Um, so can we just again, um, say thank you to Mark and jazz hands or thank you in the chat or thank you with your clapping electronic clapping thing in the corner of your screen or whatever. Um, really, really appreciated it. Thank you very much. Um, and we Diana's put a slide up to say that we've got a survey. Um, it's easy to remember because it's research-seminar-survey. Um, we've, we've been running these um, seminars since, I was just talking to Mark about it, since May 2020 was our first one. 
So what are we now, May 2022, we really want to hear from you is the what the sort of thing you like, what should we do next? What are, you know, what the best, you know, what, what you enjoy about this, the, um, the, the seminars um, and, and, and just so that we can keep providing the right sort of seminars for you basically. And then we also have a, a, another selection. This is the first seminar on cross-disciplinary computing. We have one, two, three, four, five, five more. Um, so next time, next time we have Pratim Sengupta, um, who's going to talk about science. Well, he's STEM, but science education, particularly in his work with primary teachers there. Um, very interesting um, views on um, coding and how computing can be integrated in science. We're then going to hear from Yasmin Kafir, who many of you will have heard of. She's been been. Um, in the field for a long time, who's done loads of exciting stuff with electronic textiles. I won't go through all the other speakers, but you can see we've got a range of um, really interesting speakers to hear from um, in the coming months. Generally, it's the first Tuesday of every month, though sometimes we, we change a little bit. So thank you very much for attending. We really appreciate it. So nice to see people coming back. And um, just to say thank you again and um, goodbye for now you can unmute yourself if you want to say goodbye and thank you to mark it with your with your whole voice then it all goes very noisy